أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل صلاة كاملة وسلم سلاما تاما على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل به الأقاد وتنفرج به القراب وتقضى به الحوائج وتنال به الرغائب وحسن الخواتم يستسقى الغمام بوجهه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه في كل لمحة ونفس بعدد كل معلوم لك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نويت التعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير ونفع والانتفاء والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وضعاء للهدى والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله مرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى وإلى حضرة النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Right. Um, we are looking at page 32 today and we are still following up about the virtues of having a spiritual guide. And page 32, talking about inward respect. Okay, and this, and when you're talking about respect, you're talking about adab or ethics or etiquette before a teacher. And that is the most fundamental thing. All right, And this is something that is being undermined by how the system works nowadays where as much you're encouraging, encouraging inquiry base, you're encouraging, encouraging people to question, all right, it actually also undermines the importance of actually maintaining respect for the authority that teaches you. Right? So we now even have a, a, a reality whereby students do not acknowledge, in, 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 not even in a religious setting. All right? The teachers, uh, all right, the students feel self-entitled before a teacher. All right? The teachers are the ones that feel very concerned about how they address a student, but the students never have quite care about how they talk to a teacher. It's the teacher that has to watch his words. It's the teacher that has to watch how he behaves. But the students, all right, since they feel that they are the ones that are supposed to be corrected, so they can behave in any way they want. So that undermines actually the blessing, the blessings of, of knowledge. Now, as for inward respect, so respect is outwardly and inwardly. And we discussed last week that outward respect means that you should not argue with your teacher in things that, in everything that he says, even though he is wrong. And we discussed the fact that wrong here does not refer to wrong in an obligatory manner or wrong in a fundamental manner. It's wrong if wrong here refers to a contradiction to what he asks us to do, which is not obligatory. So, for example, if a teacher is the one that tells us to fast on Monday and a, on a Monday and a Thursday, or like the fast of the Prophet, which is a Monday and a Thursday, and then you find him eating on a Monday, there is no reason for us to actually question him about that. All right, because ultimately the act of fasting on Monday or Thursday is not obligatory. obligatory. So he has a choice to eat, and so do we. Okay, if your teacher tells you to do kiamulal, to do tahajud, all right, and then you find out that he's not doing tahajud, maybe he's up watching a lousy football game, all right, this morning. Okay, and then, they, then you should not put him to task for not doing tahajud. Perhaps he has done tahajud all week, and this is one night whereby he feels a little bit tired, he feels a little bit exhausted, he wants to take a break. Do we know that it's actually important for us that in the... In between and this and this is the advice of Imam Abdullah bin Alawi Haddad. He says that when you do your worship and at times when you feel that it is rigorous, that is taking a toll on you, that you should take a break from it, that you should lighten it. So, for example, if you have been doing tahajud, all right. If you have been if you have been doing tahajud, okay. If you have been doing tahajud, okay. If you have been doing tahajud the whole the whole the whole week, and then suddenly you feel exhausted. It is important for us, all right? It is important for us to actually take a break. So one day you take a break or two days and then you resume it again. Why? Because you do not want to feel exhausted doing an act of worship that you feel traumatized to start again. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu says the best of things which are done uh, consistently, albeit in a, in, a very, in, a, in, a, in a little way. So it, it can be small, two rakaats. Two rakaats, but it's done every night. It's better than one night where you spend doing 10 rakaat and then you get exhausted. You, get, you, you start to doubt yourself and then you start to feel it as a burden. Worship is not meant to be a burden. It's, in fact, worship is supposed to lighten yourself. So the Prophet every time he feels burdened by the demands of the world, he turns to religion. 
Which is why in today's world, in today's reality, sometimes when we are faced with the burdens of the world, we don't turn to worship. We turn to elsewhere. Why? Because we see worship as burden. But the prophet, every time he's feel, he feels the, the strain of da'wah. Alright? He feels the challenge of da'wah. Hold on, yeah? You know, the last, those of you who were following my Sunday night classes, right? If you follow my Sunday night class, there was a time I have to pause my class because my neighbor was sending me oranges. So I have to pause my class now because my neighbor just sent me pizza. Alright? So, not everyone, does the, not everyone does the Sunday class. Not everyone does the, not everyone does the Sunday morning class. The only constant on these two classes is Brother Erwan. So, Brother Erwan is a sin. Alright? Uh, all right. Okay. So if I open one more class and then the neighbor comes on and send down food again, confirm. All right. Now back to this. Now, do not feel burdened. So if you feel burdened by act of worship, you, you that's why our in our reality today, all right, when we are faced by faced by the realities of the world today, which is straining us, we should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet when he's faced with the with the strains of da'wah, with the strains of calling to, to, to goodness, or with the with the burden that the, that the community places onto him, he takes wudu and prays to rakat. Alright, he takes wudu and he prays to rakaat. Okay, he feels lightened by it. So we, nowadays, we don't find the soul. The first thing that we do when we have a problem is to turn elsewhere. So we go on a frenzy now. Alright, we go on a frenzy. We share, 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 share things. Alright, we, 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 we even attack people who don't share things. We attack people for their silence. We do a lot of things, but we, we forget the most important thing is to turn to Allah SWT. To seriously turn to Allah SWT. Alright, so the scholars sometimes call it when you, when an ummah is faced with catastrophe. Alright, one well, of the first thing they should do is global tauba. They should do tauba. Alright, there was one time uh, uh, Muhammad Al Fatih, right? Muhammad Al Fatih, who is the liberator of uh, Constantinople. Alright, the liberator of Constantinople. Okay, he was the one who, who the prophet was, uh, he was supposed to be the manifestation of what the prophet says in the hadith. La tuftahun al Constantinia. Amiru, amiru wa nimal amiru wa al jaish. So the Prophet used to say that, all right, that the, the city of Constantinople, all right, which is today Istanbul, all right, it will be liberated one day because it used to be under the, the rule of the Byzantium Empire. It shall be liberated. And it will be liberated by the best of leaders. And he will be leading the best of soldiers. That person, according to historians, is Muhammad Al Fatih. This was only manifested 500 years later after the Prophet's death. Now, Muhammad Al-Fatih, before he actually conquered, before he actually liberated, all right, he was at the, he was at the borders, he was uh, at the borders of Constantinople, and he couldn't, couldn't make a penetration inside. He couldn't penetrate the defenses of the Byzantium Empire. And his teacher, all right, Al uh, Sheikh Shamsuddin, all right, came to him and told him, it's time for you and your people to do, kub, to do mass tauba, to do mass zikr, to cleanse yourself. Because Allah gives, gives victory, Allah grants opening, Allah grants ease for Allah raises those who are cleansed. In Allah, you have tawabin wa yuhibbul mutatahirin. So above all things, in all calamities that we face in the world and any part of the world now, above all things, cleanse ourselves first. Do reflection. We are out looking for victim. We are out looking. We are we are out looking for faults after faults after faults, highlighting faults after faults. Sometimes we forget to look at the faults of, our, of ourselves. And how it might have been our own fault that has led to some of the calamities that are happening in the world today. So do tawbah. And for you to do tawbah, you need to do reflection. Do reflection about your own shortcomings. If every Muslim takes the time to find it in themselves to reflect, to correct, to repent, all right, then the dua of the, of the Muslim or the dua of a Muslim will reach the heavens all right, in a manner that is not like how it is now. Right, we are doing. We are making dua with self entitlement. We are making dua with a lot of anger. We are making dua with the expectation for it to be accepted. Allah has to, Allah has to grant it. There's no other ways. Allah has to grant it the way we ask for it. So even the way we're making dua is lacking in adab, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, lacking in ethics, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. 
All right. Mm. <clears throat> so, as for inward respect, this requires that whatever he hears and accepts from his share outwardly, he should not deny inwardly. Now, this is the difficult part. All right. As for inward respect, this requires that whatever he hears and accepts from his sheikh outwardly, from his teacher outwardly, he should not deny inwardly, neither in deeds nor in words. Oh, mashallah. Okay, now everyone's like, oh, do you miss this? This teacher, this teacher is unquestionable. No, let me correct again. All right, let me clarify with you again. This is again not in matters of obligation. If a teacher tells you, don't pray subuh today, then your inward and outward should reject it. That should not be your teacher. If your teacher tells you to leave something that is obligatory, your teacher says, Ramadan, don't fast. For this Ramadan, I got, I got revelation, don't fast. Inward, outward, sideways, everything reject. That is not a, that is not a teacher. Alright? Uh, that is not a teacher. Okay? Mm. But in this instance, it is him giving you advice. It is him teaching you something. Alright? And then, you're, you cannot accept it. Why? Because you have prior knowledge. So, for example, your, your teacher tells you, all right, I give you a simple scenario. You are used to praying tahajud every night, kiamulail, all right, every night you pray kiamulail, you will do eight rakaats, every night. Eight rakaat, eight rakaat, eight rakaat. Or every day, you're, you, you are used to reading the Quran for ten pages, like Brother Rashid, right? Ten pages of Quran every day. Uh, he's flashing, all right? It's true, right? Sister Sui, he does ten pages, right? I can see someone who reach ten pages of the Quran every day. So you do ten pages, you do eight rakat, and then you meet this sheikh. And this sheikh tells you, from today onwards, I would like to advise you to just do two rakats of tahajud. Just two. Reduce it. Cut down on tahajud. Do two. And Quran, one page per, one page per day. Not, one, not ten pages, not one juzuk. Your heart should accept. Ya Allah, reducing. Shouldn't the teacher tell you to do more or do the same? Why is he asking to reduce? Ah, why should you? So the first purpose, the first thing you should understand that teachers bring different things to your different things to your table. Alright, different different things to your to your table. So if the teacher is telling you do lesser, remember all teachers, all teachers, all right, all righteous teachers will teach you the right things. Why? The teacher wants you to appreciate more of the quality of your worship. For example, if you do 10, you're focused on the quantity. 10, 10, 10. He says, now cut down the 10, do 2, but do 2 with concentration. Do 2 with focus. Or maybe he's saying do 2. Why? Because when you do 10, your family members scared, are scared to follow you. They are apprehensive to follow you. Oh, this guy is doing 10. My, my father is doing 10. My husband is doing 10. How is it? And how am I supposed to follow him? Every night we do 10 rakats. It's so burdening. You do too. Everyone feels lighthearted to follow you. Ah, we do too. Your teacher tells you, don't read, don't read 10 pages. Why? All this while you're reading 10 pages without looking at the meaning. You're just eager to go for the Khatamul Quran to com complete, complete, complete. 10, 10, 10 pages. Now your teacher says, read one page. But spend another amount of time to read up the meaning of the ad of that one page that you have read. So, Teachers, when they tell you something, so what is important is for you to know. At this point of time, the purpose of you getting a teacher is for you to acquire new knowledge. So whatever knowledge that you have, keep it. But when you meet this teacher, leave space for his knowledge now to have a place in your heart. It is unfair if you have your prior knowledge and then your teacher tells you one thing and then you decide to use that prior knowledge to object or to reject what the teacher says means that what? What's the point of having that teacher in the first place? Because you already made up your mind that you're not going to listen to him. So if you're having a teacher and he's telling you something, okay, put aside some space, accept it. So now if you have, that's why the great scholars, they have a lot of teachers. They have multiple teachers. Why? Because each teacher has a special compartment inside their hearts. All right? Every teacher has a special compartment. This teacher will give him this part. This teacher will give him this part. The more teachers you have, the more comprehensive you are in terms of your appreciation of how to better deal with the realities of yourself. Alright? So this is very important. So accept. Alright? So if you cannot accept, it means that you have not actually been able to move aside to make space for that teacher. And for the sake of your relationship with your teacher, take a break from your teacher. Take a break. 
Alright, seek permission from your shade. I take a break from this from now. Why? I need to cleanse my heart first. I need to make some space for your knowledge to come in. It's not because of the teacher's problem. It's not the teacher's problem. It's our own challenge to actually remove, to make some space for the teacher's knowledge to come in. And also, feel free to actually ask the teacher, like the companions ask the prophet. If you are like, for example, the teacher tells you to do something, and then you are feeling bur burdened by that instruction, there is nothing wrong for you to approach the teacher and ask, what is, why am, why are we, why, what is your, why are we doing this? Can I know from my, I am not sure, all right, so that I can be certain about how to act on from there. All right, so it's not wrong to ask, but not, not, but it's wrong to ask for the sake of disputing. You ask so that you know why you are doing it. Ah, all right. So, for example, if Sheikh Ahmad Saad, so when we first got to know him, there's a long list of litanies we have to recite every day. Long list of litanies we have to recite every day. Long list. The long list every day you have to do this number of we read. This number of we read. How many pages of the Quran? All right. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And now it's reduced significantly to a very short amount of litany. And when we when, when it is shortened, all right, we are, we are, it, we feel a little bit lightened. Why? Because at the end of the day, we are all working people. So when we lighten, when we have to lighten litany, and last time our litanies was spread, the weird was, was spread across the day. After Zohar, we recite this. After Fajr, we recite this. After Maghrib, we have to recite this. After you have to recite this. It's like packed. Now it's everything shifted to the morning and it's shorter. And now we start to feel lighter. Why? Oh, it's shorter. So what? We can concentrate on doing other things for the rest of the day. All right? We have, and what is the greater beauty of it? Now that you've seen the long part of it, the heavy part of it and the light part of it, now you on your own can decide in addition to the light one, you can also start to add on to your own. So now you know your limits from the biggest extent to the smallest extent. And this is the way of Jibril alayhi salam when he taught the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam the prayer time. He comes at both extreme of times, the earliest of times and the end of times. He wanted to teach the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam about, all right, about the, for example, he wanted to teach the Prophet when is the time to pray asr. When he come, he came right at the end, all right? He, he, right, he, he came at the end, at the end of Zuhur, or at the end of Zuhur, all right? And at the end of Asar, all right? Near the end of Zuhur and near the end of Asar. So show that when is the earliest of times and when is the latest of times, all right? So always that, okay? So when you have, and this is also important for you to have the best thoughts of your teacher. Because if you, for example, don't have to talk about, if you don't have, you don't have to talk about, uh, about teachers, about, 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 about Sheikh, all right? Talk about school. Oh, talk about now. Okay, so brother, brother, brother Rashid and sister Sui now, all right, loyally come to my house every day because they live nearby to come to my house for classes on, on Sunday. Now, if you're going to come to my class with doubts, will you come? Eventually, you won't come. Like, are you you will start with phony. Uh, can we believe him or not? It's serious or not? You come because you are certain. You come with the best thoughts that this person, he's got the best intentions and he's not re re teaching me anything that's fundamentally wrong. So, that is how you get the beneficial knowledge. You come to school, one of the barriers to getting beneficial knowledge in school, in normal school is when you start to doubt the teacher. When you start to doubt the teacher, it will have an overall effect on your understanding, on your appreciation, and your own being. Your body language in class will be different. All right, from someone who trusts the teacher, who has so much yearning for the teacher's knowledge, who have respect for the teacher's authority. All right? Uh, so this is this. Okay? If this is not possible, then back to the book, then he should leave the company of the sheikh until he's in a state of affairs in his complete harmony with his outer self. Uh, you know our teachers, they're understanding of this. They understand if you are, they understand if you are struggling with this. They understand if you are, that he, they can sense. They can sense. You know, I don't even, uh, that's why one of the benefits of being a teacher myself. Teacher, not, not a religious teacher. A teacher in school, when I deal with my students. You know, when I look at students, when I teach a student, right? When, I go, when he goes for one-to-one -one consultation with me, extra class. I can know from the first student's face that whatever I say to that student, he or she is not convinced. I know that there's a lot of question marks in the head. I can tell. Even though that student is nodding in the head, I know nodding is a sign that you are hoping that you don't see through me that you don't, that you, I actually don't understand. I will know. And you think your teachers, your, your, your shuyuk, your sheikh, they won't know if you are having a struggle inside. They will know even if you try to look like as pleasing as possible in class. If you're in front of your share, you like to look like you have no, no, no trouble. He will point you out. Alright? He will point you out. Alright? Uh, so, it's always good. So, that's why when you're, when you're present before a teacher, 
take a clean heart. Put your heart on a clean slate and just go in there and let him deal with your heart. All right, let him deal with your heart. All right, so just open the door and let him deal with your, with your heart. Again, I give the disclaimer, all things obligatory is is, is, is standard. Means that if things only in matters that's obligatory, all right, there, there's, a thin, there's a line here that you need to draw if only things that are obligatory is not challenged. All right, if all things that are obligatory is not, it's not challenged, okay? Mm. Now, after that, okay, now after you have gotten the, the, the value of having a good teacher, now that you have gotten a good teacher, you have gotten a good experience, now is the aftermath of it. All right, now remember, having a teacher is not a premise to break. Oh, my teacher, my teacher, this is my teacher. But Ustaz, you keep telling us about your teacher. I'm telling you about the teacher so that you know I have a teacher. Why? Because look at the first page of this look of this spiritual guide of page of page 30. The conditions for you to learn from me is that I have to learn from someone. So that you know I have a basis for my knowledge. It's not because I want to happily brag about my teacher. My teacher is someone to be proud of, but I'm not a student that he should be proud of. That's the difference. All right. My teacher is someone that I'm proud of, but I don't think I'm a student that my teacher should be proud of. There's a difference. But I'm telling about my teacher so that you know about when I'm teaching about having a teacher, I can teach this topic because I have teachers. And, should, and so should we. All right? So should. And so should we. Uh, all right? So should we, we should have the, a teacher. All right? Now, back to this. Okay? Um, going back to uh, the, 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 the aftermath. So once you have a teacher, so it's not for you to go around breaking. I know I'm a, I'm a student of so-and-so. I'm a student of so-and-so. Careful. All right? The scholars always tell us, do not break all right, too much about your teachers because if, if you do something wrong, it will, be a reflection. it will be used by people as a reflection of your teacher even though he's not like that. So careful how you carry your teacher's name. All right? And that's one of the virtues of having a teacher as well. It's like you having a parents, right? Your parents always tell you, do not, do not, do not cause shame on my face. All right? What's the Malay saying? Do not rub, do not rub, uh, arang, arang is what? Uh, do not rub charcoal on my face. All right? There's a Malay saying, right? Jangan, jangan chunting arang kat muka mak. Don't rub charcoal on my face. All right? But you rub it during NS anyway. All right? Using the camo. Camo, camo mask. Uh, never mind. All right? But do not rub charcoal on my face. Means what? Do not, do not shame me. The same goes for your teachers. Because your teachers are your spiritual parents. Do not bring shame to them. How you conduct yourself. How you be, behave yourself should be dignified. That's why Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma, he, all right, he does not narrate a hadith unless he's certain about every word of that hadith. He makes sure that it's accurately from the Prophet. He will make sure that it's essence that it is from the Prophet through and through. Then he narrates the hadith. He doesn't loosely say the hadith. Why? Because it becomes, it, he doesn't want to really misrepresent the Prophet Wasallam. Which is why some of the adab of our scholars, when they recite the hadith, they always end up with saying, Aw kama qala Nabi Wasallam. Aw kama qal. Or as or, me, or like it is mentioned by the Prophet. Our common call means or like when it is mentioned by the Prophet. Why? Because we can never, we can never reach the level of understanding, presentation, articulation of the Prophet. So when we're presenting a hadith, we're saying a hadith, we appreciate that that might not be the way it is supposed to be presented, by either by articulation, by melody. <laughs> In fact, Imam Shafi'i, he disallows people from mentioning the hadith of the Prophet. If that person does not know how to. Imam Shafi is very particular. There's a tune to it. There's a tone to it. There's a way to it. There's a grammar to it. You don't anyhow say it. You can say the spirit of the, of the hadith. You cannot articulate the exact of the hadith if you don't know how to do it. If you're not, if you're not, uh, if you're not uh, illuminated with the knowledge to do so, then don't do it. It's Imam, Imam Shafi. Now these people just, wow, anything of the hadith you just throw. All right, in IG, everything becomes so easy, becomes loose. All right, uh, okay. Now that you have gotten a teacher and you're on that path, so what is it that Imam Ghazi is telling us? Now you watch your steps. He says, he means we. Uh, all right, he here means we. He should be one, he who has a teacher now. All right, who has a sheikh now. He should be one. That he should not spend his time uploading his teacher's photos on IG. You know, right? The hotel or a picture of me with my sheikh. My sheikh. All right? Don't. Some people like to do that. All right? They take a lot of virtual pictures of, of them with their sheikh. But in the reality, they, wouldn't, they, don't, they don't attend. Some people are like that. All right? So they use their sheikh as the poster boys. All right? And this is my sheikh. All right? But when the sheikh is in town and the sheikh is presenting, they don't turn up. All right? Mm. 
He should be warned. All right. These are this is what my teacher says. These are called the uh of these are called the seasonal students. The seasonal students. All right. They come in seasons. They come in, they come in seasons. All right. He should be warned to refrain from keeping the company of immoral people. Now that you have a teacher, now be warned to refrain from keeping the company of immoral people. So that he may oust from the courtyard of his heart any loyalty or friendship with the devils from among gene and human beings and purify himself of satanic habits. In any event, he should choose poverty over wealth. Oh, wait, before all this. Ustaz, now we become antisocial already. Now that we have a teacher, we are supposed to hang out with people anymore. I'm, all my friends are gone. Remember, this is your stage as a student. So when you, are, when you have gotten a teacher, now that you've gotten knowledge, like you have, you have something, right? When you have, when you are carrying something, you are queued up, you queued up for so long, at a stall, all right, carrying a hot dish, you are walking to your table. Now every drop matters because you queued so long for this, all right, for your soup or whatever meal you are carrying it. Now will you, you be distracted by point your left, right? No, you just focus on the food, on the food you are carrying, and to place it on your table so you can consume it. Once that you are seated. It's easy. The food is there. Then you can start eating and observing, talking, socializing with people. The same goes. Now, your th this message from Imam Ghazali is standing for people who, have who are on the path of getting knowledge. Before your knowledge matures, before you appreciate the knowledge, preserve it first. Do not be distracted. All right? Do not be distracted. Of course, in, our, in, in, in Singaporean context, we have to deal with society. Alright, we are seeking knowledge now. Alright, so we are seeking knowledge. We are all reading uh, Beloved Son today. Are you all that? Next day, we will see some bad people. We meet some troublesome people. The intention is not to meet them. We don't intentionally seek to be in the company of evil people. But if people, evil people encounter us or we encounter evil people, then we deal with them in the most gracious of manner. But it is never in our intentions to deliberately find bad company to be amongst them and normalize the deeds that's happening. That's the point. If you have good deeds, keep it. Preserve it. And this is also going out to us because we are still learning. So watch it. Preserve it. It's not because of these evil people. It is our own self that we are not able to control. So remember, if you're not hanging out with bad company, it is not because of the bad company per se. It is because of your own inability to deal with the bad company. This is why your teachers are telling you, don't hang out with the bad company. You can put that in a bracket first. Deal with yourself first. Stabilize yourself first. Make yourself capable of getting the routine. And then your teacher will, will advise you accordingly on how you deal with society. For a start, to preserve your knowledge, you got yourself first. You preserve yourself first. Once you are ready, your teacher tells you, okay, then how you deal with society. So it is not about out of aloofness. Be mindful. It's not out of aloofness, out of arrogance, out of condescendence towards other people. It is more of us knowing ourselves. We know that if we hang out with certain groups of people, we are going to get distracted from acts of worship. We know that if we hang out with certain people, we will not go for classes. It's not their fault because it is their routine. But what happened to our own routine? All right? Uh, so you say that in the meantime, all right, while waiting for things to mature, while you are getting this knowledge, watch your company. All right? Because of yourself, not because of others. However, gradually you will find, all right, with time, you'll find how to live society. But as a general principle anyway, we don't seek to hang out in a bad company. As a general principle, we are nice to all kinds of people. We are nice to all kinds of people. We are nice to everybody. Nice to everybody. Right? We are nice to everybody, but keep those who are good closer to us. All right? Uh, you are nice to everybody. All right? But those who are closest to you, all right? those who are closest to you, are those who can benefit your heart. Those who are closest to you, those, can benefit. those who have no benefit to you, you can be nice to them, but you know they cannot be in your inner circles. Why? It will, it, will cause, it, will, it will be detrimental to yourself. Not because of them, because of your own self. You can have your own, all friends you have. Right? I can have all friends in the world, but Brother Aaron is always going to be dear to me. I need someone to appreciate my jokes. All right? I have to have someone who's close to me. I need someone who's close to me. You have to have your inner circle. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he deals with everyone in the best of manners. Anyone. Whether it's Abu Jahal, whether it's Abu Lahab, anyone he deals with the best of, he give the best of standards towards them. But who's in his inner circles? Abu Bakr Siddiq. Who's in his inner circle? 
Saya nak umrah bila khutab. These are his inner circles. Who are your inner circles? Who are your inner circles? Have those in your inner circles. Those that you can, that you know that they will motivate you, push you to be better. The same goes when you go to your workplace. You have all friends. All kinds of friends. You are nice to everybody. I try to. All right. you, have, you are nice to a lot of people. You try to be, you, 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 no one passes you without a smile. You will smile at them, you acknowledge them. But the one that's closest to you are those that will benefit, that, that you can have, you can learn from. Those that share a common vision about a healthy work culture. Those that are not going to cut corners. These are going to be close to you. You won't hang out with those people who cut corners. Same goes for your workplace, right? That's why I already give you these simple examples. You go to your workplace. If you're going to hang out, if your company is going to be with negative people, those people are always going to complain. They're going to whine. They're going to cut corners. They're always finding fault. You will not be productive at your workplace. You, find, you hang out with toxic people at your workplace. Even though you don't start off toxic, you're not going to be infected anyway. But if you are going out to your workplace, you're going to find people who are positive. People who see benefit in doing good things. People who take things on their chin and they just keep moving forward. Oh, these are positive people. You want to hang out with them more often. And even in their criticism of realities at workplace, they are constructive in doing so. You hang out with such people. You don't hang out with negative people. You hang out with negative people, it will wear into you. The same goes for matters of your soul, matter of your heart. Hang out with people that will enlighten it, not diminish it, not dimmer it. All right? Now, in any event, you should choose poverty over wealth. What is this? In any event, you should choose poverty. Does this mean wealth is a bad thing? When you say about poverty, it's relative to wealth. It's a relative thing. If between two things, to get more or to get enough, all is sick enough. But if more comes your way, Alhamdulillah. All right? In all things. If I have one car, Alhamdulillah. The brother Rashid has one car now. Alhamdulillah. He has one bike now. All right? Alhamdulillah. But then he has enough one day to get another car. Is there an issue? Not an issue at all. All right? But if you have to choose, always start with the one that always seek all right, to have enough. All right, only seek to have enough and also seek to enrich others. This is how you apply life. Whatever you have is always enough for yourself. But always look out on how you can make life better for other people. But Alhamdulillah. Always tell yourself, Alhamdulillah. And then see if someone else is in need, all right, then you start to be a benefit to them. Always seek, look out, look out, all right, and how you can help others. Always be thankful for your. We are lacking thankfulness for ourselves. All right, we are lacking thankfulness for. For ourselves, uh, you know, one of the this is just 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 a side tracking. You know, sometimes when we look at uh, event catastrophes, uh, challenges that's happening in other parts of the world, it is supposed to make us thankful for what we have and hope that whatever good that we have now, they have it as well. It is not meant for us to now undermine to be ingrate, to be to be ungrateful towards what we have. Some people they, they, it becomes like that, or right? when they see things there and then they say they, they, they start to feel they, they start to feel that I'm they start to feel sorry for themselves to the point where why they start to feel that oh we are having it too good here we're having it too good here all right and they start to criticize themselves this is not right because what you have now is what Allah gives to you all right if you have peace here all right it doesn't if you have peace here it's meant for you to appreciate and make the best out of the peace that you that you have if people have challenges with peace on another part of the world, you pay for peace so that you can they can enjoy the peace that you are having right now. It is not meant for you to say, that, oh, my life is lesser. Why? Because I don't have the war that they're having to. It don't make sense. Oh, our life is lesser. Why? At least they're having wars. They have challenges. So we are having it good here. They don't make sense. What you have, you be thankful for it. What others don't have, you make dua for them so that they have what you are having. If you have peace now, it's for us to appreciate and for us to understand. Therefore, this is the beauty of peace. I make dua that they can have. That's why the hadith says, La yuminu ahadukum hatta yuhid bali akhihi ma yuhid bali nafsi. Alright? You are not of complete faith until you desire for your brothers or sisters what you desire for yourself. If I desire peace for myself, I desire peace for them as well. That is that. It's not for you to say, I desire war for myself now as well so that I can suffer like them. It's not like that. It's for you to say, Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, for this. All the more I will, I will struggle to make sure that this peace is maintained, this peace is preserved, so that we don't all right, come to a point whereby we have to be, we have to be oppressive towards others. So you understand that. All right? Whatever it is elsewhere is for us to reflect and understand it here. Okay? Hmm. 
No, that tasawuf. Ah, this is another term. People are scared. Tasawuf. Oh, this tasawuf. Deep, deep. Oh, deep. Oh, tasawuf. It is simple. Correct? Right? Simple in theory. Tasawuf is always made complicated because we make it complicated. Some people, they start, once they start linking tasawuf, they start to become weird. Tasawuf is supposed to make, you know the Prophet Sallallahu who is the one who is the, the most, if someone is talking about the, who is the leader of all people who are of Tasawuf? The Prophet, because people of Tasawuf take their learnings from the Prophet Sallallahu The people who practice Tasawuf are called Sufis. But why are people scared of Sufis? Because of Sufis themselves. Some people become too sophisticated after they go into Sufism. Alright, they become sophisticated. Relax, brother, brother, everyone is a Sufi. Brother, everyone is a Sufi. That listens to Led Zeppelin. Stay away to heaven. Alright. Ah, good point, brother. Just what is Sufi? Alright. What is Sufi? He's going to talk about this later. He's talking about it later. Alright. But you know, people say Sufi. Sufi. People say, oh, what's Sufi? How those people know knows? Sufi, the Prophet, many of Sufi. It is mentioned in the Quran. Ya ta'am wa fil aswak. This is a Sufi. The, 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 the Mushkikins of Mecca, the disbelievers of Mecca say, this, what kind of Prophet is this? Ya ta'am wa fil aswak. He is the food of the commoner and he walks in the marketplaces. A Sufi is accessible to people. The Prophet is the prophet is a manifestation of what a good Sufi should be. Of high moral standards. That anyone, that anyone that passes by him benefits from him. A Sufi is of high moral standards. People benefit from them. They are easy to deal with. Some people, once they go into Sufism, suddenly they start to see the world in a different way. Even their voice tone goes one, one notch lower. Alright? One octave lower. Alright? Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. They become more Arabic. Before they became Sufi, they were, hey, bro, how are you? All right. Now they become Sufi. Ya akhi, akhi. All right. Now they become more Arabic. There's not more, there's not more Sufi. You become more Arabic. Before they became Sufi, they were, I, you. Cham, bro. Okay, jumpa aku lepas ni. Can we meet after this? Now they become, bro, Anna, na, an, you meet you at, meet Anta Beso. They're different. What is the difference? Being a Sufi means you become more poly. You become more illuminated with whatever you have, but you don't change fundamentally from what Allah has given unto you. So you know, Umar bin Khattab, before he was, before he became Muslim, all right, he was going to be outspoken. He was in your face with the matters of truth. After he became a Muslim, he was the same. He knocked on all the doors of the Mushrikin and told them, "I'm a Muslim now." He openly declared. So the manners are more polished, more dignified. All right, in the sense that the, your 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 characteristic is the same. Your personality is the same. It's just more polished now because now you're attributing your personality to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't swear. Last time you used to swear. Now you don't swear. But you are still the same person that I can put an arm around. So if brother Iran becomes more Sufi, it doesn't mean that now we see him now, he's we say, bro, before we start talking, now we do 100 istifat. No. I can still talk. We may have a meal together. We can still talk about things under the sun together. Alright, nah. so what is Sufi now? Brother, brother, brother Rashid is going to turn Sufi today. He's going to turn Sufi. Alright, nah. he's going to turn Sufi. He's going to walk home now. He's not going to take the bike anymore. He's going to walk home because he's going to be more Sufi after this. Alright. Mm. Know that Tasawuf, right, if you think about Tasawuf, alright, has two characteristics. State fa steadfastness, istiqamah, and serenity from the creation. All right, state fastness, state fa state fastness and serenity from the creation. Okay, what does it mean? Okay, whoever is steadfast, steadfast in goodness. So it is important for us to work towards steadfastness, towards istiqamah. The dua that is taught to us by our scholars is that, Allahumma jamilna bil afiyati wa salama. Oh Allah, beautify, beautify us. All right, bil afiyah with health. Wassalama, alright, with tranquility. Wahakikna bitakwa wal istiqama and strengthen us. Alright, and strengthen us, strengthen us or affirm us. Alright, bitakwa with piety and istiqama and steadfastness. So, steadfastness here means that you are always in a state of goodness. You strive to do good consistently. To be consistent in your goodness towards Allah SWT. Consistent. You pray five times a day, there's no way you're going to pray four. You're going to pray five. 
Consistent. If you are going to wake up at 5 every morning, you're going to wake up at 5 every morning. You are going to be consistent to your acts of piety even towards creations. All right? So that is steadfastness. You're going to be kind to your spouse every day, not selectively, not just on anniversary day. You're going to be kind to your neighbors, all right, on any day. All right? Uh, this is steadfastness. So that's simple. So first, Tasawuf is what? Steadfastness. So a Sufi is someone who is steadfast. Ah, Brother Rashid asking you now. A Sufi, someone, a Sufi is someone who is steadfast. Istiqamah. In good things. So in general, if you see someone who is good generally, a Muslim brother who is good generally or sister who is good generally, then that person, even though he, he doesn't declare himself as a Sufi, he is carrying Sufi characteristics. Ah, sometimes the one who claims to be Sufi, not so Sufi. But the one who is not Sufi, I know, Sufi, I'm not Sufi, I don't know anyone say. They are actually quite Sufi. They are very Sufi. All right? Some people they, who claim to be Sufi are more Dalfader than Sufi. All right? They walk around, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. <laughs> That's not so Sufi, bro. All right? Uh, they like saber, like saber. All right? Mm. Okay? And serenity from creation. Okay? Whoever is steadfast makes his manners and morals most beautiful. Most beautiful in dealing with people. Easy with people. Just look how we deal with people in social media. Blank mailing people sometimes on social media. Why are you quiet? Why are you quiet? Not so Sufi, right? Why are you quiet? Why are you not making noise about this thing? Why are you muted? Why are you sharing good news on, on social media? Why are you telling about things you are doing now? Things are happening also. Oh, you are, you are a gangster, dude. Alright? Uh, so Sufi people, they, they always live in the best of manners. They strive to be of best manners. Because why? The Prophet has the most exalted manners. Why? Inna kala'ala khulukin azim. It's got the most exalted manners. You strive to be that even though you are not officially Sufi, you are Sufi. Right? Mm. And treat them with forbearance. You are tolerant. You are understanding towards others. The prophecy is in the hadith. Al-mu'minun. Sorry. Al-mu'min. Sorry. Sorry. Look, that's grammatical error. Al-mu'min. A believer. Alright? Al-ladhi yukhalitun nas. Alright? Who mingles, all right, with fellow men, who deals with fellow men, who interacts with fellow men, all right, and is forbearing towards the challenges that they put forth to him. Azama Ajran, all right, is of a greater stature, gets greater rewards. Minal Mu'min, then the believer, Allah who decides to isolate himself, who decides not to interact with people. Wala yasbiru ala adhahum. And he's not patient. He's not forbearing towards others. All is finding fault with others. Why not this? Why not this? Right? Look at the prophet. Manifestation of forbearance. He's sitting in the mosque. A bedroom comes and urinates in the mosque. There's no greater, there's no greater ill in the mosque than to urinate in the mosque. Look at his forbearance. Look at us. He's not an adult urinating in the mosque. He's a child on diapers. You cannot tolerate them anymore. Look at this boy. Hey, this one here with the pampers. It's not the father with diapers, dude. It's the child. What's your problem? Your anti-child, is it? Alright? Look at how we like forbearance. A cat enters the mosque. It's a cat. I'll stop from him. Get the cat out of shoe. Alright? Oh, mashallah. The prophet used to have a child. Alright? Someone gave the, uh, a mother. Alright? A mother gave a child. A, 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 a toddler. So the prophet to sit on the prophet's lap. So the prophet can bless the child. And there were no diapers last time. And that child wet himself on the prophet's lap. Alright? And the prophet calmly says, whose child is this? Can you take your child away? Give me some water. And he cleans himself. Not at, not at any time he makes it uncomfortable for, for people around him. The mother was of course feeling very terrified. My child! But the prophet reacted in a cool, calm manner. That's Sufi. You are calm. You are calm in the face of... There is no one who faces a greater calamity in this world than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every year of his life, he faces challenges that of a magnitude that we only take sometimes one or twice in our life. And almost every time of his da'wah, and every almost portion of his da'wah, someone dies in his family or his companion. Someone close to him dies. Since birth, there's always someone who departs from him. Even in victory, in the Battle of Badr, he got victory. He got victory in the Battle of Badr. The greatest victory in the Battle of Badr. Yet, on the way back, he learned that his daughter has passed on. Rukaiya. We face occasional challenges. And we don't even know how to react properly. Ah. Okay. 
steadfastness and tails. That so he says, and treats them with forbearance is a Sufi. Uh, in the book it says is a Sufi. You have is you have steadfastness. You have beautiful manners. You have forbearance. You are Sufi. Imam Ghazali says so. Brother Rashid, are you Sufi? Uh, okay. Steadfastness entails that he should take for himself only so much as he deserves. That's steadfastness. You don't ask more for yourself, but you want more for others. Alright? You don't sit in the corner and see people taking more. You want to help more. Alright? You want to take more of the giving, not more of the receiving. Alright? Always making yourself useful. That's Sufi. You see that there's calamity. You go to your workplace, there's, some, there's a crisis at your workplace. And everyone's just scampering around. I'm Sufi. I'm cool. I won't get involved in this. But people need you. It's okay. I won't get this all world. You are not being so Sufi. If you are Sufi, MashaAllah, what can I help? Can I help? Can I troubleshoot something? That's Sufi. Sufi doesn't mean everyone is having problems. I go to the Musala and close the door. I lock the door. And just find Tasbih. Sunnah Tasbih. Alright? When it's over, it's over. That's not how a Sufi behaves. Alright? A Sufi is not someone when he's activated to the work. MashaAllah. It's time to go to the clinic. Take an MC. That's not so Sufi. Alright. Mm. Dealing with people in a beautiful manner entails that you do not burden people according to your own desires. Alright. But burden yourself according to their desires so as long as you do not violate the Sharia. The Prophet says, Sayyidi Ummati Khadimuhum. Alright. The leader of my people are their slaves. Means what? The people who, the one, the, the leaders are the ones that always enslave themselves to the needs of the people. They always look out for the people. That's why the prophet sets the standards. Sayyidina Abu Qasidik sets the standards. Every time they become leaders, alright, they are the ones that work the hardest for the community. They don't shake their legs. They make, give commands. They don't arrow. They take the arrow. Alright. Uh, so you can be Sufi in many ways. Alright. You can be Sufi in many ways. You go get your hands dirty as well. You don't just go around and say, do this, do this, do this. You get your hands dirty. Get it done as well. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is not one mission that the, pro, that the, the companies take part in that he's doing something. When they build a mosque, he was getting his hands dirty building a mosque. When they are in a battle, he's always the closest to the enemy. In the hadith, they say the, even the companies take shelter from, from the enemies behind the Prophet. Everything is at the front of it. All right? Everything is at the front of it. In all goodness, he's at the front of it. There's a sign of a good leader. There's a sign of a, su of a Sufi. Wallahu a'lam bisawab. Hey, we still have time. Sorry, sorry, we have time. We take it. It's 10.52. This clock has misled me. Clock is not so Sufi. Alright. Then you ask me about Ubudiyah. Uh, Ubudiyah. Becoming a servant of Allah. Uh, if you, what does it mean to be a servant of Allah? What does it mean? Okay. It comprises three things. If you have a question, you can just ask. Alright. Mm. The first, the careful observance of the command of the sacred law. Whatever Allah tells you to do, you do. Or whatever Allah forbids you to to do you for you you leave it all right whatever religion encourages you do you try to do it as best as possible whatever the, the, the religion discourages you from doing you don't do it all right this is calling for you can put that aside discipline a muslim is disciplined all right if you have to pray zuhur you pray zuhur if you have to pray outside you pray outside. do not leave your prayers so that is discipline careful observance of the command of the sacred law Second, all right, if being, being, being a servant. So the first step to being a good servant, all right, is for you to be disciplined in all that Allah tells you to do and what He forbids you from doing. Second, satisfaction with decree, faith, and the dispensation of Allah the exalted. This is next level already. Humility. Why is this the second part? Why is this second layer? The most the next higher, this is the higher layer. Because sometimes when we are doing good. We feel entitled. We think that we are getting things because we are good. For example, there's a calamity somewhere. We make dua and then we say, when it's granted, when, when things become better, we say, it's because of my dua. No. It's because Allah ordained for things to happen. Our dua is just a means of worship. It is an opportunity Allah has presented to us for us to be connected to Him. But ultimately, it's Allah who decides. Can Allah decree something without our dua? Of course He can. So, the purpose of the second part about Ubudiyah is for us to be humble. No matter how good we are. No matter how, how good we are. Or say, Hadha min fadli rabbi. This is from all the good that Allah has given unto me. Just last week, just last week, I was at Hassanah Mosque. Right, last Friday, I was at Hassanah Mosque. 
So I, I happened to meet my teacher, Ustaz Safandi, after he was sitting at the back. Right? Uh, before, after Ishak Pris was sitting at the back. So I was just talking to him. Right? So I found out he was, he's now 75 years old. Right? He's 75 years old. And one jama'ah, another, another elderly jama'ah, elderly than me, right? because I'm young. All right? Another elderly jama'ah, he comes by. And he met Ustaz Safandi. And he said, this man, you should, you should shoot Ustaz Safandi. This elderly man. Said, this man, since last time, all right, 20, 30 years ago, till now, the voice is still the same. Same manner, same voice. When I said I testified to that because I knew him. I, I was I was I, I knew him since I was in primary since I was in kindergarten. He's the same, same manner of walking, same voice tone, same everything is the same. And you know what my teacher says? Hada min fatli. He put up his hand. Hada min fatli. He put up his hand. Hada min fatli robbi. This is from what Allah has given unto me. Reverse it to us. Ya Allah, you are the same in our time. Tengok kaki lah. Look lah. Who is this you're talking about? Every night tahajud. Two rakaat. Alright. Alright. He puts in Hadha min fatli robi. Make dua for me. He says that. Hadha min fatli Make dua for me. This is why. This is Sufi. <laughs> this is Sufi. This is Sufi. Now, I observe. Alright, I observe. Alright. When I observe him in his prayers. There's, I mean, I seem like this is, you know, I say prayer is supposed to be light. This is a light prayer. Like he just makes it so easy. Like, you see prayers like, oh, mashallah, this is how I want to do my prayers. It's easy. Takes his time. He doesn't rush to his prayers. Whatever he can capture, he captures. He doesn't rush to his prayers. So there was one time at, at, at Masjid Omar, Kampung Melaka. He was Asar. So I was chasing. I was chasing for the last rakaat of Asar prayers. I saw him strolling into the mosque. Steady. And as we enter into the mosque, they were in the rush rakat. I was about to rush. Then he looks at me, see me. Steady, relax. Don't rush. All right. They gave their salam. He told me, we pray together at the back. There's no rush. If you are meant to get it, you get it. In fact, it is macro for you to rush to your salat, to run, to hurry to your salat. No, steady. If you are meant to get it, you get it. He told me before, it's one of the one of the bad habits of us is that when you're taking an escalator up for you to climb up the escalator. The escalator is going up anyway. It's not the staircase. It's static. It's going up. The purpose of the staircase is for you to move up effortlessly. Why put effort in something that's supposed to be made us effortless? If things are meant to be the way it is, appreciate the way it is. I want to look at him and wonder, what the, this guy is, and this, this teacher of mine, 75 years old, he's easy. He doesn't fall ill easily. He just that Why? Because he doesn't rush. Takes things in his stride. He's calm because he lets he lets he lets the world, all right. He lets the world evolve without him having to compromise himself. We are chasing a lot of things nowadays. We have captured not, we have captured nothing. No chasing so many things. We have not captured anything. All right. We need to be easy on ourselves. All right. The the third forsaking pleasing yourself in order to seek the pleasure of Allah. All right. This is refining. So the second one is humility. All right. Satisfaction decrease. Talking about humility, knowing that there's a greater order. And thirdly. All right, forsaking, pleasing yourself in order to seek the pleasure of Allah, the exalted, means refining. In a sense that, always seek, all right, be thankful with the little that you have, all right, and always try to give more to others who have little. Okay? So always try to control yourself. All right? This is the most difficult part, actually. For you to, when your desire says that, I want to drink, I want to eat more, you tell yourself, it's okay. All right, I control. Easy or not? No. If the food is good, if the food is good, tamba, 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 tamba. You will still tamba. Brother Aaron is testing every Tuesday night. He sees how powerful my, my lack of Sufism is. All right. All right. There's no such thing as first serving for me. The second, third, fourth. Then since fourth is not good, why? It should be in odd numbers. So it's five. Like Wittir. But this guy does only one account of Wittir. All right. Instead of doing five, he does one. But for food, he does five. All right. <laughs> so how selective we are. All right. Uh, okay. So we end at the the third. All right, and we shall continue again next week. Allah Taala alam I hope to finish this book. I, I I'm not done yet. <laughs> I hope to finish this. Uh, I hope to finish this book by the end of this year. Hopefully, ideally. But but uh, chapter uh twenty second da'wah is a long chapter. All right. So hopefully, if we stretch into next day, it's fine. All right? It's a free course anyway. All right? We'll go, we'll stretch. At the most, I'll try to not go into February. So if we were to stretch this, we'll end this book latest by, hopefully by 
by January next year, insyaAllah. Because we have a long list of programs, insyaAllah, for you to benefit from next year. New set of programs. Alright? Wallahu alam bisawab. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sabi ajman alhamdulillah bil alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Ustaz.